And finally, we're going to look at what you can do to make the future of psychological science better. So we talked about the problems that exist, the reasons they might exist, what you can do about reinterpreting previous papers that might be biased or problematic, and now what you can do to improve papers in the future. Previously on Psychology in Crisis. Psychological science is biased, negligent, exaggerated, and sometimes fraudulent. This could be due to the career incentives driven by magazines, money, and metrics. But finally, you can save psychology from all of this filth. So the five topics we're going to talk about in this session are statistical reform. Can we change the way we do statistics to improve the, the papers that we publish? Pre-registration. This is the idea that you can say what you're going to do in advance and publish that and then do the science later. Replication. Can we put more emphasis on repeating previous research to make sure that it's reliable? Open science. Can we make more of the scientific process open to everyone and, and make data and papers more freely accessible? And finally, teaching. What is the role of teaching in psychological science to make future practice better. Statistical reform has come in in several ways over the years and I'm going to pick out three of these ways and they're sort of related to each other and they all come down to the problem that people tend not to understand statistics very well. It's a, a complicated field of, of study and they're often statistics and statistical theories and statistical reasoning is often pretty difficult. So the first stream of reform in statistical practice was to try and get people to use confidence intervals more than just rely on p-values. So there was a statistical reform movement led by Fiddler and Cumming and others, and they were publishing papers trying to work out why psychologists in particular didn't really understand p-values or didn't really understand confidence intervals and trying to find ways to make them better to explain them better to people so that we might improve statistical understanding. And some journals sort of tried to uh, implement these, these recommendations and these policies of trying to improve people's reporting of confidence intervals. And it sort of worked and it sort of didn't work. A second thing that was done uh, by the same, the same group of people, essentially, was done in 2005, and that's this thing called P-REP. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but essentially this author, Killeen, suggested that replacing the standard p-value with a p-rep value would improve people's understanding of p-value. And this value was supposed to be an estimate of the chance of replicating an effect. You do one experiment, you get a p-value, uh, and that tells you if it's significant or not. And what Killeen was trying to do is change the way this p-value was calculated so that it gives you the probability that you will replicate this, this effect in the future. The problem with this is that p-rep is not, is not a measure of the likelihood of you replicating the effect. So actually, it didn't even do what it was supposed to do. And, and p-rep was calculated just using p alone. And if we were doing a statistical lecture series, we, we could talk a lot more about why p-rep isn't very useful at all. But the point is, it, it actually convinced the main journal in psychology, Psychological Science, to use PREP for several years, and they forced all their authors to publish these PREP numbers rather than P. And this, so it, it was a good, good intention, but the, the number that they replaced P with was was just as useless, if, in a way, as P is. So it didn't really change practice, and it only forced a few authors to publish their journals, their articles with PREP for a few years. So that went away eventually by about 2008, 2009, that, that thing was gone. So the most recent version of this um, approach trying to reform people's understanding of p-values came in 2018, just two years ago, with a, a paper by Benjamin and colleagues. And this had about 70 authors on this paper. And just like many modern controversial papers, it was you know, talked about on social media a great deal. And the aim of this paper was to argue that the poor scientific practice that we see in modern science and psychology uh, suggests to them that instead of using uh, 0.05 as our cutoff for our p-values in our experiments, we should make it 10 times you know, more, more difficult to make it p, p is less than 0.005. 
And the idea of that was to make the barrier for publication higher. So it means you need better data, you need stronger, more consistent data before you can publish in effect. Now, in, in principle, this sounds like quite a good idea. Just make it harder to publish, so there'll be fewer papers. There'll be fewer papers which are better. Um, but there are lots of other reasons why you might not want to do this. And I won't get into the details here, but it's important to mention that both Christopher Madden and myself uh, were on this, this paper disagreeing with the simple change to go from p equals 0, 0,5 to p less than 0, 0, 0,05. So these three attempts over the last 15 years to change the way people use statistics have ultimately failed, I think, my, my personal view. So it's a great idea to try and try and educate scientists better about statistical values, confidence intervals, and what a p-value really means. But just telling people to use confidence intervals rather than p, or to use p-rep rather than p, or to use 005 rather than 05, it's just replacing one arbitrary rule with another one. It's not actually improving people's understanding of statistical practice. And I think that's where these reform movements have gone wrong. They've just suggested replacing one rule with another equally arbitrary rule. And so I'm presenting this as a potential solution for the future, but the real underlying message is that we just need to do better statistics and understand statistics better. So a second approach, rather than trying to change or tweak the p-value, why don't we uh, just get rid of them completely? And this, this has been done uh, five years ago by the Journal of Basic and Applied Social Psychology. They have actually banned the use of p-values and confidence intervals. So for a hundred years, psychologists have been using p-values and confidence intervals and error bars and so on to make conclusions, to make decisions about their data. And this journal has taken a, the very bold step by just telling them you're not allowed to publish p-values anymore in this, in this journal. And the reason, they say, is that psychological science is just too young to be doing really tightly constrained hypothesis-driven science. And in fact, most of what we should be doing is just measuring and describing and reporting the results and sort of trying to build theories rather than trying to test theories. So they're just abandoning the idea that you can test the null hypothesis. So that's one approach, just ban the use of p-values. Uh, it's only in one journal and I guess it's a little bit controversial. And in a way it's kind of forcing people who want to publish in that journal to completely change the way they do their science. And that may be okay for that journal but it doesn't apply to any other journal. So it's a little bit limited in scope. A second possible alternative is, given that you're not going to do um, these inferential statistics, you're not going to use, not going to use p-values anymore, um, what else have you got? Well, then you've got descriptive statistics, and you can estimate things. That's essentially what the basic and applied social psychology journal is trying to encourage people to do, not to test hypotheses, but just to estimate and measure and describe. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with doing science which is exploratory or descriptive or qualitative even. And for many people that is that should be sufficient. The final option is to use a different kind of statistics. So it doesn't give you a p-value in the same way that null hypothesis testing does, um, but it gives you a different kind of likelihoods and it allows you to compare two different explanations for the same thing. And that's the Bayesian statistics that have become much more common I think in the last 20 years or so. So look out for these issues when you're doing your statistical classes and think about them when you're reading papers and you may come across some of these terms and, and issues in your general research. One thing I'd like to add is uh, a lot of these approaches try to force people to do statistics in a particular way. So the journals might ban, ban some, some kind of practices, um, societies or individual researchers or institutions might ban some things or promote other things. And this just seems very, very strange to me. Um, the rules of statistical practice vary across time, across different research fields, across different journals and different scientists and laboratories. And it seems very odd that scientists should try and impose very strict statistical rules, which are essentially quite arbitrary. I think you should be wary of just sort of replacing one set of bad practice that's based on one rule with another kind of sets of practice based on a slightly different rule. And my, my view on this is that really there's no, there's no alternative. If you want to do science, you, you simply have to understand basic statistical 
reasoning and basic statistics. And if you don't, you're going to have problems. You're going to have problems interpreting other people's work. You're going to have problems running your own experiments. And you are going to make errors. You, you simply will. So there is no alternative. If you want to do science, you need to be good at statistics. A second set of solutions for future of psychological science is to use pre-registration. Now, the idea of pre-registration seems pretty straightforward. Uh, you just force scientists to specify in advance what hypothesis they're going to test, what methods they're going to use, what results they're going to collect, and how they're going to analyse them. You force them to make all of those critical decisions before they collect the data, and you force them to write it up, to submit it to a journal, and to, and to get that proposal accepted before you even start collecting data. Now this seems kind of obvious. Yeah, that's yeah. Why 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 wouldn't scientists be doing that? Um, but there's actually a, an enormous amount of resistance from uh, more more often sort of more established or older older scientists. So it's a new thing which is coming in. Um, it's been pretty widely adopted in medicine and clinical trials, which is absolutely essential really for understanding new therapies or new drugs or new treatments or new diseases. It's really essential that we specify as much as possible of our scientific studies in advance and clearly and transparently because if we don't we have the potential to harm people when we try and use these medical results. The idea of having pre-registered and, and open trials for clinical trials uh, has really caught on quite a lot and that's um, a real achievement. And the equivalent process has been going on in psychology for over the last five to ten years and that's thanks largely to Chris Chambers's efforts at introducing pre-registration and registered reports at the journal Cortex. And now many other journals, hundreds in fact, have taken up this new approach of writing the paper before you collect the data. And different journals have slightly different mechanisms or slightly different types of articles. So you can register a new experiment, you could register a replication of an experiment, you can register a systematic review, and you can also register a verification, which is basically taking data that's already been analysed and reanalyzing it to, to verify that the, the conclusions are, are still valid. So pre-registration is an absolutely essential part of improving, in general, the specification of our theories and the specification of our, of our science. And of course, it should prevent you from p-hacking and harking all the practices that were identified as problematic it should stop you doing it because you have to say in advance what you're going to do and you can only say one thing. Science should be replicable. So it's I think it's seen as a, a real hallmark of science that our experiments, our effects and our findings should be reproducible. If you do the same experiment, you should get the same results. And it's really quite puzzling that psychology hasn't really embraced this yet. It's quite remarkable when, when physicists find something new or exciting or unusual, they might report it maybe in a press release or maybe just amongst uh, academic colleagues. And then within days or weeks, labs around the world are trying to replicate this finding pretty much immediately. And there was a case a few years ago about um, some findings in Switzerland and Italy that uh, a certain kind of particle seemed to be traveling faster than light. They published this paper, this uh, report, and, and they said, it seems very strange, so we want to check this out, so we're, we're going to publish it. And then everyone around the world who could re retest this phenomenon, they also tested it. And they essentially found that it was wrong, it was a mistake. It was due to a, <laughs> a, won a wonky cable, essentially, a, a wonky bit of kit that was plugged into the wrong spot. And very quickly, the, the field of physics introduced this idea, tested it, failed to replicate it, and then got rid of it, within literally within months. And psychology just doesn't do that. Psychology uh, never really seems to do the same experiment twice, which is very odd. There are two kinds of reproducibility that I want to talk about. One is reproducibility itself. Given the same data set, can two different sets of researchers get the same results from these data? That sounds relatively straightforward, but there are an awful lot of steps in the procedure, as we've talked about in the previous lectures, that Individual scientists can make individual decisions, and they may be the wrong ones, they may be right, they may be particular. But there are many different possible possible results that can, can come from the same data set. 
So reproducibility, can two different people get the same result? And then there's replicability, given the same general question to two different researchers or two different um, populations or samples, do you get the same answer to the same, to the same question with, with different data sets? And both of those things are really important. Reproducibility we can fix pretty simply by writing down exactly what we do uh, and putting it into computer code or really specifying exactly how we analyze the data. And both of these things really need to change and improve in psychology, and they are. A third point I think is critical is there's a lot of talk about the failure of replication in psychology and how experiments fail to replicate. And it, it's sort of treated in a very similar way to the significant, not significant distinction. So people talk about a result. Is this significant? Is the p-value less than 0 0.05? Or is it not significant? And that's the wrong way to think about it. It's not a, it's not a binary decision. It's not yes or no. It's not black or white. In fact, p-values and replication and all statistics are variable, random, noisy processes. And the important point in this slide is to say that replication itself is not a yes or no answer to a question. Does this experiment replicate? Does that one replicate? Instead, we need to model all these things, just as we make models for our statistical theories and we test our models with ANOVAs and t-tests and so on. Bernard de Weser points out in a, in a paper that we should not be making the same mistakes as we've always made with replication. So we've made mistakes about p-values and interpreting data the wrongly. So we shouldn't make even, <laughs> even more mistakes in a different way about replication. We need to be really careful. We need to model our data and model our replication attempts really carefully. And then Olivia Guest has also pointed out this year that this modeling of our of our data should be embedded in a systematic framework of testing theories in psychological science. So we shouldn't just take a data set, run a test, publish the results, get another data set, run another test, publish those results. We need to make sure that what we're really doing in science in general is testing a theory, building a theory and testing a theory. And Guest and Martin propose that we should use these computational program type methods to, to, to write the rules of how we do research. So scientific reform shouldn't be just inventing a few arbitrary new rules about which p-values to use or, or how to replicate things. We should embed the whole process in a systematic, formal approach. Uh, I, I don't know what's happened there. That seems, that seems to be a mistake. Just kidding. You've probably seen this uh, when you're looking for a journal and you're maybe not logged into the Nottingham computer or you're not on the right not on the right network. You'll go to a journal and you're trying to find a scientific article and you just get uh, a paywall, a sign that the article is locked away behind a behind a vault of some sort and you can't access it. And this is the problem of open access and open science. So still, in 2020, hundreds of years after scientific publishing was invented, we're still putting most of our scientific articles behind a wall, a paywall, so that the general public and scientists across the world cannot access it without a, a subscription. And people have pointed out that this is pretty crazy. Um, so most research in the world is funded by taxpayers or governments or charities. Second, most universities will then buy the journals or, or even pay to publish individual articles in these journals. And then articles then are still only available to buy if you don't have an institutional subscription. So in a sense, the taxpayer is, is paying three times for scientific articles. First, they fund the research, then they fund the journals, and then they make you buy the articles. So some, in some cases, in some countries, you simply can't access scientific articles. And there are ways around this, which I won't go into, but open science is a real problem and open access of, of individual articles needs to improve. And it is improving. There are many, many schemes now, which is fantastic, to open up science to make it more available to everyone. So we've talked about pre-registration of your studies, your protocols. You can put in your ethics and your conflicts of interest. And there are various databases and various systems now for you to pre-register your science in advance. There's a wonderful thing, a massive website called the Open Science Framework, where you can put all of your raw data. You can put your raw data, your code, your materials. You can choose to make them public, or you can choose to keep them private for a short time. And that allows everyone in the world to, to get your data and to reproduce your findings. 
we've talked about open access publishing and this is where the outputs of research so the, the journals the papers the books the patents the websites all those things can be made freely available to everyone on the internet and that is a big a big barrier at the moment lots of journals aren't aren't available aren't publishing open access papers and as a, as a reviewer as a peer reviewer you can put your comments online uh, at pubpeer.com or you can um, sign up to one of these two schemes, Publons or Reviewer Credits, to get credit for the work you do as a peer reviewer. So often if you're an anonymous peer reviewer, you get no credit at all. You're not named, partly through choice, but you also don't get any benefits, essentially. All you're doing is performing a private service for the journal. But now you can start to get credit scores for your input to the scientific system. And finally, at the bottom, there's three badges you can get for your journal. And there's a, there's a procedure called the Transparency and Openness Promotion, which tries to make journals better at making open science, open data, open materials, and pre-registered studies. Perhaps most importantly, and I was quite surprised that neither Chambers or Ritchie mentioned this in their two books about the scientific crisis in psychology. They, neither of them mentioned teaching, and that seemed to me to be quite odd, because undergraduates are the future psychological scientists so some of you will go on to master's degrees some of you will go on to phds and and some of you will be researchers or clinicians or you'll be contributing to the future of psychological science so it seems critical to me that we must teach better and and more open science and that's why this lecture is now in the chip course so we want you to understand that there are problems in science the way it's done there's a history, there's a philosophy, and there's also the, the practical problems of science, and, and, but they are our solutions. So your science can be better, your research projects can be better, your understanding of conceptual issues, your understanding of statistics, of research methods, your understanding of all the modules can be improved by understanding the kinds of problems that exist in, in science. And indeed, psychologists may be even better placed because they can do research on research. They can do meta-science. So psychologists can do research about research processes to understand the problems and we can try and improve things by, for example, getting the BPS to institute open science in, in teaching. There's a really nice article out this month by uh, Whitaker and Guest and they've written about uh, this amusing broken science, which is their attempt to look at sexism and sort of classism and racism in the open science movement. Now you'd hope that the open science movement itself should be really open and democratic, uh, but as with many things, there, there's sometimes there's sort of a bit of a there's a bit of a clique, a small set of people, mostly men, who are sort of running the show. And that article is a really good introduction to the problems of modern science, and it was only out a couple of weeks ago, so it's really up to date. And finally, uh, last week I had a look for reviews of Chris Chambers' book on seven deadly sins. And I saw this and I thought it was uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty funny. Um, so an anonymous reviewer has reviewed Chris Chambers' book with three stars and said, sadly, nothing new is the title. This is a timely book and well written. Sadly, it's been written before by Theodore Barber and published in 1976. Barber's book was called Pitfalls in Human Research, 10 Pivotal Points. And it covers pretty much the same ground as this one though with more methodological detail and less glitz. It's a very sad testament to psychological science that the same points are made decade in, decade out, and nothing much changes. People are making the same mistakes today as they were 40 years ago. The conclusion must be that no one really cares, save one or two oddballs like Barber and Chambers. There are careers to be made, and doing things rigorous and properly is just a barrier to the more important matter of advancing yourself. Believe nothing you read from psychologists is probably the lesson to be drawn from these books. Although this is a negative review, uh, I think it makes some wonderful points. That basically, we're all still humans and we're all still doing our research in the same sort of dodgy way that we've always been doing it. So I guess you've got to learn from history. You've got to read as much as possible. You've got to, yeah, you've got to spend some time in the library to try and save yourself some wasted time in the lab. But I think my view is that there's a much more positive perspective on this. And although the problems existed 40 years ago, as they still exist today, what's really changed is the internet, social media, 
availability of information, open access, pre-registration. These are all things that didn't exist in 1976. These, these are all things that have changed and got better and become more open. And we must keep pushing for psychological science to be more open and to be better, more rigorous and more reliable and more reproducible. And that's your job. Final questions on the final Q&A. Let's make it interesting. <laughs>